A few miles from South Beach, a group of scientists from the University of Miami are making final preparations aboard the ROV Walton Smith. They are embarking on a three-day voyage to conduct a series of experiments years in the making. Their goal is to investigate the impacts of one of the worst environmental disasters in U.S. history, the 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spill. The team is interested in how the spill affected fish in the Gulf of Mexico, particularly the commercially and recreationally viable mahi-mahi. Leela Schlenker is the experiment's lead scientist. We're out here on the RV Walton Smith, deploying pop-up satellite archival tags on wild mahi-mahi. And we're doing that basically to look at the habitat utilization, so temperatures and depths that these fish inhabit, their migratory routes, and also any possible spawning behaviors. We did a previous experiment last summer where I looked at the spawning behavior of tagged fish in a tank at our experimental hatchery. So we knew exactly when these fish were spawning and I looked at the acceleration behavior right at that point and used that information to predict when fish in the wild were spawning based on uh, what they're, how they're accelerating and how they're behaving. So this is really interesting information. It'll be the first time that we've collected information like this on wild mahi to detect when they're spawning um, and following up on some previous work to look at how they move and what habitats they, they spend time in. This new research will shed light on this ecologically and economically important species, while also providing valuable insights on other open water fish impacted by oil spills. This boat is a 96-foot catamaran, uh, so it's not a typical fishing vessel, to say the least. It's, it's a little slower, a little bit less maneuverable than your typical fishing boat. And the reason that we're on this boat is because we need space for our recovery tanks. So mahi-mahi are very sensitive to handling. That's part of the reason why um, they haven't been tagged as much as some other species in the past. We have these recovery tanks that we pump oxygen, seawater, um, to keep the fish in good shape, let them recover from the angling event. But to put those tanks on the back of a boat, we need a, we need a fairly large boat. Luckily for Leela and the crew, not far away, another vessel is also heading out to sea. Professional anglers aboard the Miss Brit will assist the RV Walton Smith in tracking down and catching schools of fish. With their experience and mobility, it's not long before they come across a large school of mahi-mahi. When they hook up on a few fish, they radio for the Walton Smith to join them. The plan is to hook fish with lines from the Miss Brit and then transfer those lines to the Walton Smith. Fish that they catch on their vessel, they're able to transfer to us using this tennis ball method. Essentially, we have a tennis ball with some Dacron through that and a good sturdy knot that's not gonna slip. And what we do is we clip that onto a line over here, cast this ball to them. They unhook the leader with the fish attached to it, clip it into our line and we're able to reel it into the boat. So because they're more maneuverable and a faster boat and they also have a very experienced captain on board, they're, they're beating us out right now at finding fish. Basically, I've been going down to bring the fish in as, they, as we reel them in and we get them close to the boat. Uh, we'll pull them into this sling and I'll have be on one end and we'll have someone else on top of the deck that will cinch this rope down and as soon as they come in, pull it tight while I'm grabbing them from the other end and then we truck them on up the stairs up onto the deck here where we have a recovery tub uh, and we go ahead and start the tagging process and work up the fish. Each time we've caught a fish, we brought it up through through the uh, dive platform into in this vinyl sling. The sling keeps water inside of it. That way the fish is never really exposed to any air. As soon as we get it into this bin, we rest, rest this sling right in the bin. And 
immediately we're scooping new water into that sling. We've also got an oxygen stone that we keep in here, so that's like good, fresh, oxygenated water. And that's one of the ways that we can keep the fish healthy while we're doing this stressful process of handling them. We keep the time in the sling as short as possible, so it's just a measurement, sex ID, initial sort of condition of the fish, looking at the color, the tag goes in, fin clip, and then immediately transferred to one of our recovery tanks. Teamwork is essential during the entire process. Limiting the amount of time the fish is on the line or out of the water will help reduce stress and improve the chances of survival. Basically, this gets inserted through the pterygiophore bones, which come up off the spinal column, and those bones help lock this tag dart into place. We then take the needle out, the tag stays in those bones, locked right there. Each of these different sensors on the tag, we're taking temperature, depth, light levels, and acceleration every five minutes over the 96 day tagging period. The tanks were designed to pull in fresh seawater from the Gulf Stream and mix with oxygen to aid with recovery, John Stieglitz explains. So these are our tanks we use to keep the fish alive while they're on board the vessel. Uh, we have the ability to recirculate the water in these tanks as well as use them as flow through tanks and simply pull seawater from the Gulf Stream direct it into these tanks, flush out any waste products that may be in the water and maintain optimal conditions for the fish. So these tanks are equipped with oxygen, aeration, have a directional current in there to help the mahi swim and orient. Uh, we also have our chiller there so we can maintain optimal temperatures for the fish. It's stressful being in those tanks, but we want to limit that as much as possible. The fish will recover for 24 hours in these tanks before they are released in the same waters where they were caught. The team ensures the fish will survive by constantly monitoring the water quality of the tanks. All right, right now I'm checking the dissolved oxygen and the temperature in the tanks, making sure that they're at good levels for the fish, keeping them healthy. 160, 10.27. And it looks like we are getting what we want here. Fish are looking good. Uh, we have two different tanks. We have three fish now in one and four in the other. We're making sure that we monitor both temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen, salinity, and ammonia basically every single hour. What we're also doing is keeping track of which, which tank is flushing and which tank is not flushing using fresh seawater. The purpose of that is to see how much the ammonia builds up over time and to just make sure that the fish do okay under static exposure. And the reason for that is because eventually we hope to expose mahi on board to oil. And of course we would need static flow, or we would need static, um, and, and no flow in that sort of situation. Fish that were too small to bear tag, we use those for studying um, wild mahi and their organs like the heart. So this is the heart? So what we can do is we can compare this to captive bred mahi mahi and other species of fish to see kind of where they fall in the scale of who has like a really athletic heart um, versus species that are maybe more sluggish. What we found is that the, the mahi heart is really um, really aerobic, so meaning that it requires a lot of oxygen, and the number of vessels per unit of muscle mass really reflects that. The team also deploys a CTD, which stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth, periodically off the stern of the ship. This instrument collects water samples at different depths so that researchers can study the oxygen, chlorophyll, and nutrient content of the water column. This can provide insight on why fish are found in certain areas and depths. Is it about one o'clock? 
Uh, I didn't, but I'm probably seeing them on the radar right now. Okay. That's why you want to head that way? Yeah, if we can, that'd be really good. See if we can get a couple more fish before this day is over. Yeah, so we've got some diving birds off of our starboard side, so that's always a good sign that there's bait in the water, and bait usually means fish, which here often means mahi, so we're going to check it out. The team will continue to catch and tag as many mahi-mahi as they can over the next two days. So right now we're on day three of this trip. We are pretty excited with how well it's gone. We've got seven good looking fish in the tank right now. We released two yesterday. Uh, so we're, we're very happy with, with what, we've, what we've, a lot of the things that we've learned and releasing healthy fish is always a great feeling. Everyone's a little bit tired now, but um, we're keeping it together for the last day and make sure that we release all these fish in good, healthy condition. Uh, yesterday was really hectic and very successful. We have a number of fish that are tagged that we are ready to release. We are we're now spending a few hours looking for hopefully a few extra fish to tag uh, before we release what we have, uh, do a CTD to just determine water quality in the area where we release the fish and also actually the area where we caught most of the fish and, uh, and then, then we're calling it the quits for this cruise and, uh, and, and heading back to shore waiting for these satellite tanks to be released from the fish rise to the surface and transmit data to the satellites. If all goes well these tanks will stay on the fish for about 90 days. Uh, you know we expect that some some will be released early due to either predation events, so the mahi that we've tagged will be preyed upon by, by some animal and that will release the tag prematurely. Uh, but but we're, we're going to be very excited over the next 90 days just waiting for these fish to, uh, to release the tags and, and provide us data. Overall it's been, it's, been, it's been great, really, really successful. When it is time to release the fish, the water level in the tanks is drained and the fish are gently corralled back into the sling and carried down toward the water. So when we're ready to release the fish, we lower the level of the, the water in the tanks. We're gonna wait until it drops to about maybe knee height. Someone's actually gonna get into the tank with the fish, being really careful not to cause them any more stress than they're already experiencing. And then basically we wanna try and very gently herd them into our, into our sling, just like we did when we brought them into the boat. So once they're in that sling, we're gonna quickly raise that. We've got water with them in the sling so they're not having any air exposure. Lift them over the tank, down the stairs, just like they came into the boat, and then gently let them go over the side. Yeah. Oh my gosh, look at that thing accelerate. Holy that one did really well too. Yeah. You see the These tags are programmed to collect important temperature, depth, migration, and acceleration data over the next 96 days. really incredible to see them swim off. This is an amazing experience to be in the water when you're watching one of these tag fish swim away. They have a ton of spirit left. They are usually very happy to get away from us and that is wonderful to see. This experiment is preparing us for hopefully a future experiment in the Gulf of Mexico where we can actually use these recovery tanks that we used successfully here on this research trip 
to oil expose one group of fish, have another control group, and directly look at the effects of oil exposure. We hope to do that right in the area where oil was spilled in 2010, and that'll allow us both to look at um, the area that these fish were in at the time, how they moved through that, through that region, and all of the effects that the oil brings with it. So we know in the lab we see reduced swimming performance, reduced cardiac output, these things obviously have effects on wild fish and so this will be really the only way we can take a look at that is to use these pop-up satellite archival tags to follow these fish, see how their habitat utilization, their migration, their spawning behavior is affected by oil exposure. By increasing our understanding of the impact of oil spills on fish, we can help determine best plans of action and how to minimize the damage done to fisheries and the millions of people who depend on them.